Portland in the 18th team in Major League Soccer. It's the City Portland Championship. It is great to be home. Sports Sunday with Orlando Sanchez. Rip City, I know you can relate to this. Seven-year-old Abdul Rahman's reaction almost as exciting as the play that inspired it. His mom says the family never misses a game because he loves his Blazers. 24 hours later, everyone is still talking about that unbelievable finish. My goodness. <laughs> what is good, everyone? Welcome to Sports Sunday. My name is Orlando Sanchez. Art Edwards in the house. Art, what'd you think about that video, man? Oh, oh man, that was something else. I had to watch it from Belgium. I'm, <laughs> I'm there for the Cyclocross World Championships. And there's a Portland connection. You'll find out about that a little bit later. I think we call that a tease. Nice work, Art. We yes. need you back here to talk a little bit about Rip City because what a night it was, Art. An improbable finish. The Trailblazers defying the odds as Damian Lillard added a new chapter to his legendary career, scoring six points in nine seconds to beat the Bulls. Portland had a 19-point lead slip away. Chicago stormed all the way back, going up by five with 11 seconds left on the clock. Then just a wild series of events took place. Lillard knocks down the three from 37 feet. And then Gary Trent Jr. able to force a jump ball here. And then he wins the tip against the slam dunk champion. The ball ends up in the hands of Lillard and well, the rest is history. Beating the buzzer and securing the 123-122 win. Lillard had 44 points and nine assists. No one on the team is surprised by what he does, but where does that mentality come from? Lillard said it's his family, and he told one really good story about where it all started as an eight-year-old football player. I quit, you know, after that one season when I was eight, I was like, I don't want to play no more. You know, my family was getting on me like, you scared, you don't want to get hit, you a six-play player. And I remember me and my brother got bikes, you know, we had the uh, Mongoose bikes, and we had plates on the front of them, and my brother had his football number on there, and I wanted to put a different number on there, but they... Just because I was so bad, they made me put my football number on there, which was number 63. <laughs> and I was the smallest <laughs> dude on the team for the next year and a half. Like, you scared. You don't want to play. You don't want to get hit. So I was like, I told my family, I'm going to play. I'm going to play next year. I'm going to play one more time. And when I was 11 years old, I came back and I played. I was defensive player of the year. After that, I, I quit again. For me, it was just like, if y'all going to challenge me this way, like, I'm going to answer the call and I'm going to show you I'm not scared. It's just not what I want to do. And I think that's where it started. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> and this is what it was like in the locker room. I mean, they had to cool the man off. Lillard and the Blazers, they'll visit the Bucks on Monday. Forward Derek Jones Jr. will not play due to a sprained left foot. You love to see it, right, Art? You do, and they shouldn't cool him off. They need him hot. Yeah, <laughs> especially <laughs> facing the Bucks, one of That's the best right. teams in the league. All right, Art, we're just a week away from Super Bowl 55, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers against the Kansas City Chiefs. So here's what Raymond James Stadium looks like. Crews have been working to get everything just right for the big game. They may have even cleaned up that pirate ship. <laughs> the fan experience is underway. Not quite the same amount of hype and attendance as years of the past due to the pandemic. The Kansas City Chiefs are the defending champs. They're three-point favorites. They only lost two games this year. They beat the Bucks in Tampa by three points just two months ago. The Bucks will be the first team to host the Super Bowl in their home stadium. This is Tom Brady's 10th appearance, and he's won it all six times, more than any player in NFL history, Art. <laughs> all right, so we're wondering who everybody has in this ball game. We asked KGW staff members to make their picks. Put them Our on the Sunrise spot. team, they, you know, pretty much united. Drew and Brenda picking Rod Hill's Chiefs to win. Surprise, surprise, so is Rod. <laughs> We've been hearing a lot about that. Dan Haggerty also likes the Chiefs. Nina Melhoff, Laurel Porter, 
Matt Zafino, all think the Buccaneers are going to take it, although I think Nina needs to work on that score a little bit. <laughs> Brittany <laughs> Falkers, still a little bit bitter, you think? <laughs> the Packers lost. She's picking both teams to lose next week and giving the Pack the title by default. It's going to be all right. Hang in there. <laughs> Art, man. the question for you, man, who yeah. you got? Well, I think it's going to be Kansas City. You know what? Since they beat my 49ers last year, let them win it again. That's what I think. High score, low score, what do you think? Oh, I think high score. I think high score. I think it's going to be a crazy game. It's going to be a lot of fun. I will say the more points scored in this game, the better the odds are that the Bucks have a chance to win this game. Yeah. I'll also roll with the Kansas City Chiefs. You give Andy Reid a bye week to get ready. I mean, he's been almost perfect in the NFL when he has that extra time to play with. Oh, but yeah. the Kansas City Chiefs have been the best team all year. I would have made this pick at the beginning of the year. That hasn't changed right yeah. now. They are a well-oiled machine. No doubt. All right, Art, there are always crazy prop bets for the Super Bowl. <laughs> Here are a few. Dumping electrolyte-infused beverages on the heads of coaches is a time-honored tradition. But what color will the dumped Gatorade be? So here are the front runners. Orange is in the top spot. Yeah. Then you've also got red and you've got water, lime green, yellow, purple. Make your pick, but that purple's got some chance there to make some serious money. You know, I think so. <laughs> hey, the, UN, the NFL invited thousands of first responders and healthcare workers to go to the game. When will they get their first mention? That's another one of the bets. The over-under is 179 and a half seconds after kickoff. That's basically three minutes into the game. <laughs> I think they're going to mention it pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. All right, the, how about this one? The first missed field goal, and there's all kinds of choices. <laughs> I'm rooting for the hits the crossbar at 10 to 1, man. I like that one, too. <laughs> go for the big money bet. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Go big or go home. <laughs> now, right. there are a lot of little known and fun facts about <laughs> the Super Bowl, so we decided to take a look at a few. We start with this one. How did the Super Bowl get its name? Any guesses? All right, well, <laughs> the answer is it started as the AFL-NFL World Championship game. Kansas City Chiefs owner Lamar Hunt suggested the term Super Bowl. It was inspired by his kid's Super Ball. You know those bouncy balls? Oh, yeah, I had, <laughs> had lots of those when you, I was a kid. Did you? Yeah, lots me of too, them. man. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, our next one, our next question. Why is the Super Bowl measured in Roman numerals? Well, because a football season runs over two calendar years, so they didn't want to get everybody all confused. They didn't start it until the fifth year, though. I'm, like, less mad about that now that I know the answer to that one, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so how about this one? What current NFL teams have never played in a mm. Super Bowl? Any guesses? Four teams. <laughs> the Detroit Lions, Houston Texans, Jacksonville Jaguars, and, oh, the Cleveland Browns. At least they're making progress, the Browns. No doubt, man. <laughs> One day, C.J. McCollum, it's going to happen. Your Browns are going to get there, That's man. That's right. <laughs> All right, we're just getting started, man. We got a yes, tease coming up here. A legendary softball player, a sports industry trailblazer, and she lives in Oregon. ESPN's Jessica Mendoza talks about breaking barriers in broadcasting and what it's like being a role model to so many people. Welcome back to Sports Sunday. From Olympic gold to sports broadcaster, Jessica Mendoza is at the top of her game living in Oregon. And she's paving the way for others in the world of sports. I got the chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with ESPN analyst, Jessica Mendoza. It was crazy. Like, just literally being in Bend, Oregon, having the guy I'm working with be in, like, Chicago, Illinois, the production team being in Connecticut, and the game actually being in South Korea, and the guy who's up to bat is from Venezuela. And I'm like, <laughs> this is crazy. Like, but it was awesome. What a trip. Jessica Mendoza was providing color commentary for Korean baseball really? in the middle of the night That's from her true. home in Bend. Pretty cool. Mendoza is an Olympic gold medalist, Hall of Fame softball player, an ESPN analyst, a wife and mother of two, living in Oregon. There's a sense of just really just being who you are and being accepted, regardless of what that looks like. But I feel like I'm home. I have to bow down to the queen, Jessica Mendoza. Three straight yeah. pitches, change up, curveball, curveball. Look like, how this is happening. Them. This is the best team in the American League. Mendoza is a pioneer in the broadcast world, continuously making history. 
the first woman to serve as an analyst for nationally televised MLB games. I realized that when I'm going to work every day that there's thousands of girls, there's hundreds of thousands of women that want to break that same barrier. And it might not be within Major League Baseball, it could be within their workplace. And the most important thing that I think I understand is that this isn't about me doing a good job for myself, my own job, but really to be successful so that more men who are hiring understand that women are just as equal to, if not better, at, at so many jobs that are out there. There's been criticism along the way and pressure to succeed with so many looking up to her. I feel that pressure of hundreds of thousands of girls and women and like the expectation and not just women, but Hispanics. I'm not going to lie to you and say, oh, so awesome. Like there's days it's, it's hard. I mean, I feel that anxiety and that pressure for sure in a way that can sometimes be overwhelming, but then I have to think about it like, okay, but at the end of the day, like just do your job well and you're going to be doing that for this many people. In 2020, Mendoza became the first female analyst to call the World Series on national radio. As somebody who grew up loving the game, what did it mean to you to call the World Series? The first time I ever went to a Major League Baseball game was in Dodger Stadium. And I watched Fernando Valenzuela and, you know, Fernando Mania and his influence on the Hispanic culture within in and around Los Angeles was so huge. Um, and, and that just really helped bring me and honestly my family into the Dodger bubble, if you will. And so then to see, you know, 32 years later, to be able to call the next time that they win the World Series, I think in that moment I was like, whoa. Such an awesome conversation, man. Still to come, the Oregon State Beavers getting back to their winning ways. How they pulled off a third straight win in Salt Lake City. Donovan McDavid and the, the power play group has said they're getting the chances they want, they just got to execute. Here's McDavid all the way, scores! Did that just happen? Oh, it did. Oilers center, Connor McDavid scored one of the most impressive goals of the year against the Maple Leafs on Saturday. He went coast to coast, blowing by every Toronto defender on the ice to finish off his sensational solo effort to give the Oilers a 3-1 lead. And that is your Toyota Sunday sizzle. <laughs> The Oregon State women's basketball team art is starting to rack up oh, the yeah. wins, collecting a third straight W, putting in work on a Sunday in Salt Lake City. You seen these I highlights yet, Art? Well, I'm just now. Yeah, man, the Beavers, they went on a 20 to nothing run midway through the game, and they went on to beat Utah 84-74. Aaliyah Goodman is balling out. She had 21 points in this one. And how about the freshman, Sasha Goforth? She celebrated her birthday with 16 points and 10 boards. Along with the three game winning streak, OSU now has a winning record at six and five. All right. Hey, the Oregon State men visiting 23rd ranked UCLA. Beavers not messing around, around in this one right off the tip off. Jared Lucas set the tone. Beavers going shot for shot with the ranked Bruins in the first half. Ethan Thompson, he led the way with 16 points. But he was the only Beaver in double digits. This was a grind, and UCLA was able to lock up the OSU offense. Bruins win at 57-52. OSU falls to 8-7 and seven on the season. A little bit of soccer news right now. Major League Soccer announced its plan for the upcoming season. Teams can begin training on February 22nd. Regular season starts on Saturday, April 3rd and it's going to feature 34 matches. Timber schedule not released just yet. They're still working on that. MLS is always also working with the Canadian teams, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, to try and figure out plans for the 2021 season because there are still travel restrictions between the U.S. and Canada. I can't believe how close we are to the soccer season. Oh, yeah. The Portland Thorns report to camp on Monday to get ready for the NWSL Challenge Cup. That's set to begin in April. The league announcing this year's tournament will be played in home markets rather than a bubble like it was last year. After the month-long Challenge Cup, the regular season kicks off in mid-May. A schedule will be released at a later date. We'll be right back. Don't blink. That's Oregon's Makaya Williams setting the program record in the 60-meter dash at the Razorback Invitational in Arkansas. The freshman from Benton High School, yeah, from Portland, ran a time of 6.56 seconds, fastest time in the NCAA so far this year. Get down. 
Hey, Portland's Clara Hansinger finished fourth at the UCI Cyclocross World Championships in Belgium. She's the reigning national champion and was the top American finisher. Cyclocross is crazy. A lot of the races have laps and a short course that has pavement, wooded trails, grass, steep hills, obstacles. We talked to her uh, a couple of years ago when she was just getting on the international scene. Sometimes they even have to carry their bikes. <laughs> I tell you what, that is some wild stuff. You gotta be tough. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> now, I, I'm not doing that, by the way. No, no, neither am I. No way. <laughs> well, we got a week to find out how wrong we'll be about the Super Bowl. Art. That's right. You excited for the big game, man? I'm excited, real excited. <laughs> well, nice work as usual, man. It's time to call it a night. Thank you so much for watching. That does it for the show. We leave you with our Place of the Week. 20 seconds before time. Already is time. Lights, camera, action. Showtime. The heart of a champion. My opponents hate it. The throne is for the take. It's Five seconds left. Covington trying to get it to Dang. He puts on the floor. Step back three from Dang. Oh! Pinen! Damien! Lillard! Tiche has a Thunders at home. It's swatted out of bounds by the freshman Sasha Goforth. She said not on my birthday. Dozen seconds left. Loose along the near wall. Warp free. And the Devils clear it again. They score! Butler left side. Oh my goodness! This was for the culture. In the heat of the summer, keep it up. Really they go look right here. That is a tough, tough shot. The ball from the official.